I'd like to take a moment just to introduce uh, Hank here. He's come all the way over from California. He's going to be the uh, master judge at the UK Dairy Expo. Um, and he's going to give us a little talk on, on farm protocols and the expansion. Um, and I don't know, maybe Hank will go into a bit more detail. But I've heard you started with 40 cows. Right. Yep. My father did. Yeah, yeah exactly. And now you're at 2,250. Somewhere over there, yeah. Yeah. So if anyone in this room knows about expansion, this is probably the chap. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a nice uh, presentation from Hank. And then we're going to try and get a very interactive session. So the more questions you guys can ask, I think the better the session will run. If you can, there will be a roaming mic. If you can put your hands up, say what you, where you're from, uh, who you are, and what you do, I think that'd be a, a great step forward. Um, but without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Hank Van Axel. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for asking me when uh, I got this. Uh, it was a little bit my fault, but we, uh, when they talked to me about doing this, I thought it'd be like 20, 30 farmers, and I come here and I go, whoops. I was uh, much more nervous about doing this than maybe uh, judging those cows today. Uh, it's a little bit more in my realm. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to speak to you all here, and I guess I'll start with uh, talking a little bit about my dairy. And I think... Uh, I know this is lunchtime, right after lunch, and I've been to these meetings, and it's the worst time, so I'm not going to talk too long. I think farmers, I hope, appreciate it. I know I do, but I will try to give you some uh, provocative thoughts, uh, something to think about, because uh, as I talk about it, you'll realize that we as in California are going through, uh, uh, probably going what you're going through about 20 years ago uh, in expansions and in growth, the way you guys are growing. And this is a little bit about our farm. My mom and dad came from Holland right after World War II. And uh, in the 50s, they had an opportunity to start on this farm, the home farm. And uh, from there, uh, he milked cows for another person, and, and he got a chance to, and he started with 40 cows. This is our other locale. We have three different farms uh, where we, we farm, and, and that's why my cow, when they say how many cows I milk, the third farm is kind of a buoyant farm where we bring cows, that's their last trip, and then they go to the beef market, so sometimes, or if someone wants to buy cattle, so our, our cow numbers do go up and down. Here's our current, uh, well there, I, I don't even, six, almost 1,700 Holsteins, uh, that many jerseys. The rolling herd average for the jerseys is uh, 22,000. And that just, uh, guy just got told last week is number one in the nation for our herd size. And the Holstein's just under 33,000. Uh, we also farm, <coughs> excuse me, we farm about 2,300 acres, 2,360. Uh, it's all our feed. We raise almost all our feed, plus we have quite a bit of excess feed that we do sell to some other farms. And uh, we have. There, there it is, 1,500 of corn silage, wheat, and uh, our area, unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, is uh, being taken over by the grape business. So I'm not sure how much further our, our farms are going to be, but the grape industry has uh, gone to our region, and, uh, and, and we are now like a postage stamp uh, in the grape business. Uh, it's surrounding us. We do uh, also uh, the custom work, like we say, the 2,300 acres. Uh, we grow our corn, silage, alfalfa, and, and the grapes. And we, with that, we do all our own, all our own work. Everything that we do is, is uh, it, the only thing we don't do is bale or alfalfa hay. Other than that, we do all our own custom work, all our own slurry, manure, everything that you can think of. We raise our own calves. Everything we do ourselves. Um, this is our corn from last year. Our corn would average in the 30 ton range per acre. There's our silage pit. <laughs> There's another one. That's me up on top, right there. So uh, we put up, in this pit, we put up uh, 32,000 ton of silage. This is uh, the reason we do what we do. I have three, three children. My wife and I, Carolyn, have three children, two girls and one boy. And they were, uh, we're lucky and fortunate. They're all involved in some aspect of the dairy industry. My uh, youngest daughter, Jennifer and Brian, he runs our Bomatic maintenance uh, for, the, for the, uh, the dairy, our farm, plus another 70 through Bomatic. And my other daughter, uh, Sarah, does uh, like your young farmer program. She helps uh, organize that. And uh, she also 
does articles for like the Cosmopolitan magazine, uh, all dairy magazines. And her husband, Jared, is a semen salesman for Alta, California. So, and then my son, Adam, and his wife, Lacey, are back on the farm. And this is uh, the, the grandchildren, so I had to make sure my wife saw that I put these on because I think they match, there, there are seven of them, and I think I fall in the eighth slot behind those seven with her. Okay, well, these are, this is kind of what I'm going to talk about a little bit today, and I, I think uh, when, I, when I do this, we, uh, we often as dairymen go forward when opportunity knocks, and I see that happening here uh, very much so. Sometimes not always planning as well as we are just going to go because we have that opportunity, and we, at me and most other dairymen in my, in my mindset think, well, we're just going to do better than somebody else, and we're going to roll, and we're going to get there as quick as we can. And I'd say the, uh, the best thing, uh, my, my father said this a long time ago, is the best thing about a dairyman is independence. But also the worst thing about a dairyman is his independence. And his ability to, to talk when you, know, when you go, when, when he goes forward. And right now we see a very, in California, 20 years ago, as I said earlier, the EU is very similar. We have a quota system. And 20 years ago, we saw an opportunity. We had a large growth expansion in L.A. where L.A. ground was worth a lot of money. There was a lot of farms there. So they transplanted those farms, and we had quota, just like you do. But then we were allowed to produce over our quota because they saw this huge expansion, ability of expansion for milk. So we, get, we were able to produce over our quota, and a quota was at a higher price, but we could overproduce. And many of these farms sold their farm by the square inch and then went and grow, grew and doubled, tripled, quadrupled the farms. You hear about these farms in the Tulare area, the number one production state in the world. And it worked because we had least, least, per, uh, least cost production, we had cheap feed, and we, had, uh, we made a deal with, the, uh, with our co-ops and our, and our manufacturing that we wanted them to grow. So we built into our pricing system a mechanism for them to make their management managerial or their, their managerial money. But we didn't force them to grow and to sell their product. They, they just were able to make it at a margin. And what we got is a lot, of, a lot of huge powder plants. And our price dropped. And now we are $2 lower 100 than anyone else in the United States. We're the number one production area in the United States by 20%. We beat Wisconsin by 20%. We beat most countries in our state by. But now our margins have grown, uh, are, are not near as good as they were, or, or much less, and we have $2 less, 100 So when we talk about expansion, did we do it correctly or not? Well, that's some things that we have to think about. We, I think it's very positive that we grew. But there should be some thought, pro and that's what I think I I'd like to bring to you is some, some things that we might talk about in, in the dairy industry. Like I said, we've gone through expansion and, uh, and protocol, and uh, this, I guess, brings me into the whole subject. And I'd uh, like to know how many people, if you had to have a raise of hand, how many people are 45 years or older that are dairymen here? Okay, fairly good. And, and then... How many are partners with their sons or daughters or managers that you have partnerships that you're going to go and expand with in, in this up in, in next coming years? So not quite as many as I would think. But with that, how many are third generation farmers? Wow. You know, you guys should all clap because, you know, a third generation farmer, to keep the farm to the fourth generation, and this is a worldwide study done. Do you know how many will be, how many uh, of you will make it? On an average, not saying, in, in, not saying in Scotland, but on an average, 10%. 10%. So that's why when you have these large expansions and, and, and you get into the management things, you go, why am I bringing this up? Because there is uh, different ideas when in, in, Cal in the United States and California. That's why I, I didn't want to talk a lot. There's, our age of dairymen has gone way up. We're in the 50s. Our, uh, the average dairyman's age in, in the United States is 50. And we're bringing our kids along to be the next generation. And then when we do the expansions, well, a guy like me, 
I'm in the, my mid-50s now. Am I wondering, do I want to go out and spend and go straight ahead and go and take my retirement right with me <laughs> with my son? And my son wants to go because he's the guy that's a hard-charging individual. So this is something that I say when we talk about protocol and we got, talk about how we are going to do your farm management, I think it starts on the top, very top. So first of all, when you have that, you have... Uh, you, you got to know that. You got to want to do that. But the very first thing that when you do that, you all get together, you talk about price. Price and the market. And too many of us now let our milk go. As soon as it leaves our yard, that's what we're worried about. We don't care about it after it leaves the yard. And I'm going to tell you, when you lose these quotas, that's the last time you'll ever be thinking of that again. Because you lose that, you're going to lose that basis that you need, <coughs> that you're going to need to, and you're going to want to know exactly, exactly where you are and what you're going to do with your expansions because the EU and the world market and the US, where you become that market. It's no longer your farm as you expand. You're going to have to watch that market. And that comes all the way to your management, all the way through. So I say first and foremost, you, you want to find out about your price and your, your marketer, who's marketing your product. And that's for your management as well. Your managers or whoever you are, your management and employees should know where your milk is going and what it's doing. And you find out that with that, you talk with your, your, your man, you, the people that take your milk and you, you say to them, okay, my expansion is going to be... I, what do you want for my milk? Do you want high butter fat? Do you want this or that? You go back and you have your management team get your protocol set up to say with your nutritionist, whoever, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And this is where we are. But too many times you just make, we, we in California, we did, we made the product and then just let them worry about selling it. And I think those times are, uh, I think that's a bump, a speed bump that if you guys are expanding, with your, and bring your management team with you, you want to bring that part together to stop that speed bump, to know that when you're growing and your, your, your product's growing, that you get something that gets you to the best of your ability, the amount of money per unit that you can, you can get. In essence, if, you're, if they have incentives for butter fat, then you work with your nutritionist and your veterinarian or whoever. And, the, and then with that plan with your son and Figure out which way you want to go and how you want to get there, or your son, daughter, or whatever. I'm, I'm using my son, excuse me for that, but plan, try to fly it out. Secondly is financing. And usually a person my age, I don't know, I, I, I don't need to raise a hand, but I just want you all to think about it. Someone that has a son or somebody else in their business, how many times have you gone with your, your uh, management team and talked about finances of the farm? I, I, I would dare say not too many. And I'm not talking about always the nuts and bolts of the, but I'm talking about setting up the financing of your farm. And this is where we have the biggest word that you have not had, but you're going to see. And it's a word that I never knew until about eight, ten years ago, and that word's volatility. And in a dairy business uh, in California, it's a foul word, really. It's, it, I think it's another cuss word almost. It's gotten to, because we are dealing with it. We're dealing with it at, at a very high and rapid rate. And we have, uh, I know, I, I talked to some of the dairymen today, you dropped 30% in, in the last little while. Is that correct on your price of milk? Well, from January 1st to now, we dropped 48% on one month of milk check. So when you're financing, you're expanding, and you're thinking about having a, work, uh, a workforce and so forth and so on, when you're smaller, you're able to absorb some of those not wanting to, but you absorb it because you just have to work a little harder and get a little less money. But if you grow and your management team grows, you're going to have to pay your management team the money on a monthly basis and also your finance and your, and your, finance and your bank. So you really need to know your financing and, and you need to really think about and ask them if they understand volatility. And I think everyone in your team as you go forward in expansion, needs to know the word volatility. Because guys, 
I can guarantee you dollars to donuts, you're going to have volatility. And it's going to be something that you're going to, you probably have never, how long has your system been in? 30 years? The quota system? 30 something years? So this is something when you're doing this and you're growing and you're going to expand, it's something that you really have to be aware of. And we as uh, in the dairy industry and in, in our hedging and how we do it now, that's what we do. That's what I end up doing, spending most of my time doing. Be quiet. Hedging on feed, hedging on milk, hedging on everything. And if, be quite honest, it's a different mindset completely. So when you're starting, when you start setting your management protocol and your workers protocol, it really starts on top with what you guys are going to, how you're going to manage and the protocols that you're going to use. So we have monthly meetings with my management team and we bring in our veterinarians, our nutritionists, and we go through everything there. And we do that with our finance. And I, I do it with my finance, with my accountant, and so forth. And we try to set budgets. And it was a darndest thing because my accountant, he, he, uh, he asked me, he goes, well, what's your budget for milk price going to be? And I go, I don't know, you know, I just throw it up in the air because we really cannot do that. So now I've gone to the point where I do now farm. That's my hedge. I think that's something that we, uh, I've become more of a farmer. We've gained a thousand acres and that's my hedge. So you got to think that as you grow and then you got to have a farm team set up with the same like in mind. Um, let me see. Yes, and again, I'm talking about the five-year plan, the 10-year plan with your finance people. Because if you're, uh, you know, actually in California, that's why I'm not going to talk too much longer, but in California, when you have people, we have a lot of partnerships, uh, father to son, and we're having a lot of that going on, and then we're doing this expansion, so we're trying to figure out, and like I said earlier, we have a different goal, where I want to be in 10 years financially, and where my son or, or my manager, my young manager that's aggressive, wants to be. And you need to get them all on the same page so that when you come to the five-year, you sit down and your, and your management team, so far as financing and, and so forth, that you have your goals set up so that you don't start going like this. Because I don't care how good your dairy is, how good your management team, your protocol for your employees, if you have different mindsets about where you want to go from the top, you're, gonna, you're never going to be successful. And we've seen that time and time again with these rapid expansions that we had that I saw here and I saw in Holland uh, not too long ago and, and heard of in Ireland. You grow so fast and then you just start going and you just start making money and you're just trying to get ahead of the next guy. But then five, six years, seven years down the road, you think, well, I'm about good with this. I got my... And then your son or your partner has a whole other idea. And then you have conflict. When you have conflict on the top, it just goes right through your whole system. So that's something that I think uh, it really needs to be done. And now kind of on the management protocol of people. Form a business model. Form a goal for the management, for the ownership, and a personality. A personnel, excuse me. Find the best talents for your personnel and learn how to manage them. And that's probably one of the more difficult things you do have as you grow from a smaller to a larger operation. You, uh, again, you're going from a smaller employee base to double or triple that. This will be the most difficult transition that most farmers make because many farmers, they can walk out, in, out, of their, out of their house and they can get in there, whatever, and walk around the farm, and they see things automatically because they've been trained all their lives, even their children, their son. They see things that they think are obvious. That protocol, you've got to stop and realize that the people that you are now employing don't realize those things, and they have to be shown. And the most important thing you can do is have a written protocol for each one of these jobs that they have. So if, uh, if you have calf... You're going to have a calf raise. You're going to have a person in charge of feeding cows. You're going to have a person in charge of maintenance or and then breeding and, and all these different or in charge of your milk facility. So each one of those has to have a handwritten thing. And then you need to step back and let them happen. Uh, this is a great story that happened to me when I was young. And, and we just transitioned into a new milk barn. And I had a milker there that had had a bad day. 
and we didn't have too much, uh, you know, we didn't have any of these protocols in, in place. And he came a little late to work, and the other milkers were upset, and they told me. And so I came in there, and I kind of scolded him, and, and I was in a hurry, and I kind of scolded him. Well, I came through the process, and he was in the afternoon, and he was, now in retrospect, I say he was having a bad day. I should have known better, but he was having a bad day, probably drank too much the night before, I'm not sure. But he then proceeded to be a little slower and get behind the other milkers. So I uh, went back into the barn, and I was being uh, that go-hard go kind of a guy, and I got after him. And I made his bad day my worst day because he looked at me and he says, I quit, and he walked out, and I had to finish his shift which got done at 12 o'clock, and I had to wake up at 4 in the morning to get my stuff done so I could milk his shift again. I learned, no, walk away, have your protocols in place, come back and talk to them. And that's something, as you expand, I'm not saying you let it expand, but you've got to minimize, you, you gotta minimize your, your, uh, your problems. You've got to make sure that you have your protocol in place so that works 90% of the time. The other, uh, another great advantage I had is I had a, a, someone from a university, a young, young lad, he was uh, graduating and he had to do his thesis on how to milk cows. And he wanted to do a scorecard and he tried to get a scorecard and so he wanted to watch 3,000, or 6,000, excuse me, of our milkings and, and score them. So he'd be sitting there and he sat there for two days doing these scorecards. And he's a very enthusiastic young man from a smaller farm and he came to me and I said, well, you got done? And he goes, yes, yes, I go, everything go good. And he was very, very upset. And I go, well, what's, what's wrong, son? And this is, you got to realize, this is me only about 10 years ago. So my mindset's changed. And he goes, oh, I, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm very upset. I go, uh, my father would be upset. He goes, uh, at, for those 6,000 milkings, he goes, I got to tell you, three cows didn't get milk. They put the machine on, and the takeoff came off. All, and he goes, I'm upset. I had to tell you. I'm sorry. And I go, only three? That's a pretty good day. <laughs> and so that's my mindset. So now I can go back and talk to the guy. I go, hey, I saw this, but hey, you guys can't let it happen again. But I'm not going charging in there. And I think that's something that you've got to realize because you're so used to doing everything yourself and your hands-on people. The smaller the operation, the more hands-on you are. And as you get older or larger, and larger, you're going to get more and more of that. And you've got to be able to have that conception of you have to manage it and keep those road bumps and stop the road bumps. And that comes, again, having your protocol. We have once weekly protocol meetings with each unit, our calf feeding unit, our, vet, our vets. We have the vet come in, and we have nutrition come in every two weeks when we get done with our vet day, and we stop, and we, have, and we make it, a positive thing that we talk about everything but then it's always I think very positive to have someone from the outside because they see things that you might not see because you're just going your regular way so if you have one of them in there with and when they tell like my we have in-house AI we do all our own AI when they tell him Here, here's your numbers here's maybe what you're not doing correctly it's it works a lot better than me saying it than their boss or something, because it comes from somebody else, and then they go, oh, well, he has, no, he has nothing in the game. He's just doing what he's supposed to be doing. And he goes, or on the other side, hey, you did a great job. You did, you're one of the highest percentage conception rates we had this month. Congratulations, and we'll do some. We do not incentivize, incentivize, how do you say that correctly? We don't give people bonuses on their, uh, if they do a better job. We'd like to pay them well, and then we do group bonuses. Let's say we have less than 1% death loss on the calves. I bring them all in. I said, we did a great job. We'll have a dinner or lunch, and I might give them all some money. But I don't do it on a monthly basis, and I don't do it with the cows, with the milkers, or anything else, because what you end up with is you can end up with friction. One guy, let's, you have one guy over here or one guy over there. And if you know, if we had a great month and we know it, and they get this, they will work at it and they'll think about it better. But when you have friction in between your milkers, then you have fighting. And in fighting, and, and it, to me, that's something that we really don't. That, and we've tried it both ways, and I see it better 
that way that we make sure. And the thing is that we just got to interact with them more. And that's something that you got to learn how to do is interact. You know, you might check on something, but you also check on them. Them. And uh, we do that into farming as well. Uh, we, you, you guys don't have to do this. I wish we could do it a lot more as irrigate. <laughs> We have, uh, we have to irrigate, so we have uh, a staff of uh, starting, unfortunately starting when I get home, we're gonna start irrigating. And uh, so we have a staff of six that are on, will milk the whole, irrigate the whole time. It's a tough job. It's a really tough job. So we work it out that uh, not me alone, but each one of our uh, the managers at a certain time will grab them, bring them sodas, do some things, and if they got done on time, we'll kick them off a day and a half early and give them, but pay them for it. And those are the kind of incentives we try to do. And then if they know you'll do those kind of things, they'll work harder for you. But if you put a, that they need to do this on, the, like somatic cell is a good example. Yeah, we have a great somatic cell, but all of a sudden the, the, the week before the somatic cell limit's done, six or seven cows come into the hospital string. Yeah, they're the only thing, they, they're, they, they didn't think about it until they go, oh, that money's there, and then they kick them out. Instead of stripping the cow out, doing it correctly from the beginning, they'll kick them out because they want to get the bonus. And that isn't how you want to make bonuses. So, in closing, I've talked plenty. In closing, I have a thought that my, uh, my dad, a, a story that I had and, a, and, and something my dad said. Uh, when I was a young man, I went to a meeting kind of like this, a luncheon meeting and, uh, with a dairyman, and... I was kind of in awe of him as he bragged, and he says, uh, I got to go back to the, to the barn, and uh, I got to milk. He says, I've milked for five years, twice a day, never missed a milking. And I was kind of admired that, and then he says, and I haven't taken a day off for five years. So I said, wow, five years, not a day off, and twice milkings? I said, that's quite a, quite a feat. So I went home, and I actually told my father this, and my father looked at me, and he says, well, son, I'm going to tell you. He goes, Work hard, and when you work, work really hard and enjoy what you do. He goes, but you always run your dairy farm. Don't let your dairy farm run you. I think that's when you're expanding, make sure that you keep that mindset, that you work hard, but don't let it overtake you. You run your dairy. With that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take some. Anything about anything at all, please. Good, and I put them all to sleep. There you go. Go ahead. Uh, uh, you spoke about um, hedging milk and hedging various things. And there isn't really a futures market in milk in this country for the individual dairy farmer at the moment. But could you talk me through what, what you do? And do, you, do you hedge a certain percentage of your milk, or how do you go about it? Well, it's a very good question. See, uh, we in California have a hard time hedging, too. Uh, with, with milk. It's kind of a hard because it's off the Chicago board. So that's when I talk about your processor. So I've, we, uh, Hillmar cheese is where we ship our milk. So I, I go to my processor and I think this would behoove this whole industry here to don't let, uh, don't let the other people tell you how you're going to market your milk. You get that milk in, with some kind of a foresight on a hedging program that makes sense for you that brings everybody into play a little. Because for us to hedge, we have a different pricing mechanism than, than others do. So what I've done with Hillmar Cheese, they go to their buyers of their product and they go, would you want to, uh, I did this seven months ago because I'm, I, I thought I saw this coming. So I locked in um, about 40% of my milk at a dollar eighty-three for a hundred weight, uh, eighteen dollars and thirty-three cents a hundred weight. So I did that all the way along. But my big hedge and something that we in California are really finding out is feed. You can hedge by owning your own feed because you can't. There's no way you can buy it cheaper than whatever you raise. And if you're going to get bigger, I would much, I'd much say that you need to go out and buy land for feed and make sure that I have all of my roughages. I own every bit of my roughage. I have it in a pot. Actually, I'm eight months ahead on my feed. And I do that for a reason because I'm afraid of what might happen in this next little while. Uh, it, there could be, 
after 09, no matter, I'll, I'll give you something to think about. And it, take it as a challenge, because it's helped me be a much better Darren, much better manager of money, much better. But in 09, every dairyman in the state of California, the best, the best dairyman, the very best dairyman, lost $150 a cow a month for six months. The worst dairyman, or not worst dairy, big dairyman, dairymen that were leveraged, they weren't bad dairymen. There was a, there was a 6,000 cow dairyman that lost $250 a milk cow a month for six months. If you do the math, that's a lot of millions. And you can't hedge. That's why I say it's so important because you are going to see. I didn't really ever use the word volatility until about eight, ten years ago. Now that word is something that's used on every talk, that every meeting you have here, like we have in the dairy industry. That's the first thing they talk about is volatility. And that volatility, it doesn't matter if you're the best manager in the world and you, you have your funding in line for your dairy, you need to be careful because that, your lender needs to know that there could be a hiccup for six or eight months and all of a sudden you can't cash flow. And they need to be with you on that and they need to understand that. And I think that's something that this group's, uh, that's one of their protocols, is to get your financiers in line with you to understand that they're not gonna have that bottom of the road that they used to. Afternoon, Hank uh, Ian Lindsay from LKL. Uh, two questions, really. Uh, at what point during your expansion process did you realize that, heck, I'm now a people manager and not a cow manager? And how did you go about giving yourselves the skills to, to, to do that role? And secondly, when you're speaking with your staff about the volatility, the pressure on the farm, etc., how do you do it in such a way that gets them behind you rather than them thinking, well, it's the boss having a moan again? Yeah, very good question. First, I, I found out when I really started doing it was when I fired that milker. That's when I started thinking. I go, you know, I mean, when he fired me. He fired me, and, and you'll find that out. He fired me. And you find out that uh, the old adage, you need to learn how to manage your people, is the, kind of the old adage of your, you see quarters over there, but you got dollar bills coming out of your rear end here. And that's, you've got to look at, I, I, I've come, become much better at understanding. And it took, a, it took some hard knocks for me. But now they have program, like the protocol. That's a wonderful thing. Getting other staff people, getting other personnel involved, getting your nutritionist, your vet, and getting them involved, that's something we start, I started uh, 15 years ago. So when we did another, when we went from 1,500 to 2,000, 10 years ago, when we went 1,500 to 2,000, that's when I really started uh, seeing that, you know, I, I, I spend more time managing. I get up the same time and I go out, but I, don't, I, I go in and see the hospital string and them, them getting milked. And then I, but then I go, instead of seeing, uh, looking at the calves, or, I go see the sheets to see how many we have. And see, and then I can see if he's supposed to mark if he's marked and fed all the calves' colostrum. I spend my time, but if you get these guidelines in place where you can make it so that you walk and you look, and then you walk and you look, and I go to my feeder. We have a, a feeder that uh, all our, comes to a computer to our computer. Well, then I see if he fed the right amounts, and if he's off, and 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 so forth, and different things. So you end up doing spending your time doing that. And we also have now have a feed company that hedges my grant, my feed for me. They literally they, they and you'll find that might be something that starts happening here. You might get a it, it won't be a co-op. It'll be a, a, a independent, and they'll go out and they'll get. He owns. I mean, he manages for four hundred thousand head of of feed. So he's got the hammer. So he can go to a lot of people and he can make a deal for uh, soya or corn or rolled corn. So you'll see that, that you, you don't always have to be the biggest. You just need to be part of a group that has a control that you can be part of that group and get into that. Does that answer it? Uh, yeah, um, the, the oh. second part about how you, know, how you uh, inform your staff of the, the pressures that are facing you well, at the farm without appearing to have a moment. Yeah, we, we, yeah, like in 09, uh, there was devastation. We lost 700 farmers 
uh, in, in the state of California. And I didn't have to say too much because I had guys every day coming for a job because we had so many farms. But then I had to bring that to them and I had to explain to them that this is, uh, you know, it was the worst year we'd ever seen. So what, what we try to do, when I, what I try to do is try to bring them along and it's, it's, I have to be careful because you, you, you got to be careful when you do this, that you just say, well, we, we're, we're a little nervous now. We're hedging a bit because this business for the next eight months does not look good. And we need to be more cognizant of, of where we are in our feed for our calves or for whatever else. Let's, and we might hedge here. We might cut here. And we bring the nutritionist and the, and the vet in as well. So they can do it as well. And, and when, especially with us, it's to feed more than anything, how we, how we take care of it. Or the management of uh, the other, uh, and the farm side is the herbicides and the sprays. So I said, well, we're maybe going to get down. We have a herbicide specialist comes in. Well, we're maybe going to stay at 60%, but explain why. And that's it. Any other questions? Oh, oh. Part, yes, Jersey and Holstein's both, yes. Uh, no, it's all right. Uh. Well, it's for everyone else. Uh, yeah, so I just asked if you, you've got, do you have a preference for one breed over the other and why you have both? Um, I, I, I really don't. I, I know that right now Holsteins make me more money. I mean, uh, because we, uh, we have, uh, we're in the beef business very big in California, in, in the United States right now. We lost 60% of the beef herd because of drought. So beef cattle uh, or, or beef uh, is keeping us, because our milk price is below cost of production right now. So, but the beef business is helping us. So a, a Jersey, a, a really fat, good Jersey would bring me maybe a thousand dollars, a perfect one. A big, fat Holstein will bring me 1,700. <coughs> and they're bull calves right now. The difference is, and I've, I've heard this, I, I didn't realize this, because I always thought you got a lot of money for bull calves. We used to have to give them away. We're getting $400 a bull calf for a Holstein. Day old. And we have people driving around trying to get them all the time. And, uh, that, and with a jersey, we got to give them away. So, I, I, but jerseys I love because they, they're, they're more efficient and they breed better and the butter fat. The reason I have both is because I chip, sip to the cheese plant, so I mix. Instead of mixing breeds, I don't believe in mixing the breeds. I keep Jersey's Jersey's and Holstein's Holstein's and I breed for butter fat. Um, one, and the one place goes to a powder plant, so I'm bleeding for pounds of milk. That, that, that farm averages 110 pounds of milk a day. The Jersey farm averages four, seven because I bring all my high fat, butter fat Holsteins to that farm and we make cheese out of it. So instead of, that's why I like the jerseys because I can bring that in and we have, and again, it came to what I talked earlier about, you talk to your people, whoever you're gonna sell your milk to. If it's a supermarket, do they want high butter fat or do they want really clean milk? You say, if I'm gonna do this, are you gonna give me incentives to, to keep on going? That's what we do with Hillmar. Hillmar gives me an incentive to give me a higher butter fat product. So. That's how that works. Okay, any more? Well, I'm glad you guys all, oh. Thank you, Hank. Um, it's Michael Bain from Zimpro. I wanted to ask you, um, in California, I hear of uh, the constraints on businesses in terms of the, the resources that you have available. Um, and you've mentioned that you've got a good level of forage, I think. But I, I'm intrigued. Um, I hear about water being an increasing issue to Californian producers. Is, is that right? Um, and, and in saying that, what do you feel the constraints will be in the next two or three years to your businesses? It's looking uh, forward. Well, I, I was going to leave my problems out of this deal. but. <laughs> Well, we have, uh, it's devastating. I've never, uh, as long as I've been alive, I've never seen it. This fourth year of severe drought. And it's something for you to guys to think about. It's like we're talking about a world market. If we don't get, if, in this next two months, and they don't like to talk about it, but if we don't get it, it's going to be, it's going to have, it might get us through the dairy industry through the next four, five, six months. But if we don't get it, you're literally going to see animals and farms dry up. 
it's that dry. It's amazing. You, you can't fathom how dry it is. And, and again, it's, it's probably, I think probably the milk that we produce is probably maybe double of Scotland. So you just imagine it, uh, you're going to take 20, you're going to cut that by 50% or better. Because you're, it could happen. I, 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 I would never say it. I sit on two water boards, and just before I came here, I, I listened to them. And uh, people are not worried about farming or agriculture in California. We've become the yuppie state. I don't know if that makes sense here, but we've become very uh, open, and you know everything's good about the environment and so forth. And we have not. They don't care about food. I think we've done. The the world's been fed too cheaply and they don't realize it. And now we're in second and third generation. So they actually had a, the LA Times came out with a front page proposal that we fallow a million acres in the middle of the San Joaquin Delta, the most fertile ground in the world and the most prosperous ground. And just, they thought that would be the answer because LA needs their swimming pools. And uh, they, it's, it's, and LA is a desert. They didn't know that, but the LA is a desert. But the mindset is that they don't worry about food, and they actually had actually, in, as you went through the article, why should we worry about feeding and exporting to other countries? So we, we you look at them, and I go, well, Paramount Pictures just put 150,000 acres of almonds in the Central Valley, and we're getting taken over by almonds and grapes, California. And Paramount Pictures put in 150,000 acres of almonds. I says, well, why don't you tell Paramount Pictures that they can't sell anything else? All their movies got to stay in the state of California. You know, but that's, they don't understand that. that isn't, they don't have any, any conception of what that's about. So it's a scary. It will have a dramatic effect on the price, just like they talked about New Zealand. New Zealand and their drought. And it maybe wasn't as severe as they say, but this one... I can tell you it's the real deal. <laughs> well, oh. wait, wait, wait. I was trying to, I see a couple guys nodding, so I didn't want to stay too much longer. Just on the minutiae, really, um, are you betting on sand your cows? And, and if so, or if not, what's the cow comfort situation on your farm, and, and how important is that to you and your cows and your profitability? Well, uh, we, we don't bet on, with sand. We, uh, we, we have a little bit more warmer weather and longer sun, <laughs> drier weather, maybe longer than we want, as I just said. But we uh, have manure separators, and we flush because we don't have to worry about the cold weather. We flush all our water, and all the manure goes down over a manure separator, and then we can, the summer, we have it, and we compost it, and we heat it up. It, it, if we take a pile of manure and we line them up and we heat it up, we get 180 degrees, and it kills all the bacteria. And then we pile that up, and that we've we've tried everything. We've tried mats and everything. We've and by far, if I put out a row of dried composted manure, and I put a, a row of sand and a row of mats, the composted manure will be full every time before the rest. And that's kind of my. I don't watch too many other videos. I just let the cows. They never lie. The cows will tell you the truth every time. So that's why we do. I, I, if I could, probably in a new system, probably would be sand because of the, the uh, somatic cell counts. You can probably do a little better, better with that than, than with the manure. We have to manage it a little bit better. So, okay. Any more questions? Well, thank you again very much. I appreciate it. Um, I know right after lunch it's hard to listen to a guy like me talk too long. So, again, I appreciate it, and uh, good luck in the future. Thank you very much, Hank.